right, so while that's getting ready to go there, let me make sure this is up here. And I'll hit pause on this other channel really quick. There we go. Okay, so I think we're off now. Um, so relative motion. Uh, if you want, I could start with a, a, a screen share here. And we were on page 78. Whoops, and so in the file, it's probably page 80. There we go. So this is what we want to talk about. Uh, if you had me for Physics 110, I know you've seen this a little bit, but um, we'll just kind of review this and, and kind of get you back up to speed. So um, I, I, I like to think about why we should care about this. Um, so sometimes if you know why this is useful, uh, that might help you uh, study it, right? That's basically it. And so it turns out in a great number of applications, we are going to study two different objects that are moving. This happens all the time. For example, one, one situation that comes to mind for a physicist would be uh, beam ex uh, accelerators physics, right? Where you have beams uh, smashing into each other and one of them's moving one way, one of them's moving another, and they have these two beams smash into each other. And so what's important there is the uh, sometimes what you do is you switch to a different reference frame. So there's the frame where both of the objects are moving, or you could shift into the frame where A is at rest or B is at rest. And that's what this is talking about. If you don't know what I mean by frame, I basically mean a coordinate system. And I want to emphasize something here. Take a look at this. Here, both of these particles are moving relative to the Earth, whereas over here, we pretend that B is at rest. So you make B like the origin at rest and we see how that affects A's motion relative to B. Now, um, again, this happens, what if you want to uh, analyze the motion of your rocket relative to another rocket? For example, in a missile defense system, that's another one that jumps to mind. Uh, the era I grew up in, we were trying to stop Scud missiles from impacting uh, people in the Middle East. Uh, so they had the Patriot Missile Defense System. So these are kind of obscure references, I know, uh, particle beam physics and Scud missiles. But there are, there are basically are practical applications. Maybe a more obvious one might be air traffic controller. And you could imagine A and B are two different planes. And maybe A wants to know how quickly or so from a pilot in plane B might want to know how quickly the plane in A is approaching it, right? It could care less how fast they're moving relative to the earth. What B really cares about is that other plane headed towards me or not? And if so, how quickly and how long do I have to react? So there's a number of situations. So that's why we might care. Um, now, I think sometimes a simulation might make this make a little bit more sense. So I made one up here. Uh, let me see if I get it up here and get the right one. All right. So um, I did this last semester in my 110 class. I was like, oh, this is what's helping them. So we, I think this might help you. So um, uh, let me just run this program and just give you an idea here. All right. So imagine we have two objects, A and B. All right. And so right here, I could pick a reference frame. So I'm looking down here at this bottom right here. So I'm going to start by picking the reference frame relative to Earth, but then we could see what the situation looks like from A's perspective or B's perspective. So um, let me clear this out. So I'm going to hit the Earth button and watch what happens. The white coordinate system is not moving, and we see that the red one's kind of moving up and to the left, the blue one's moving uh, down and to the right, and there's the speeds that they're moving at. What if I run this from B's perspective? From B's perspective, you see that the blue ball sits still right in the middle of the frame and everything else moves. From A's perspective, A is sitting still and the other two are moving back away from it. So I'm gonna play the earth again. I'm gonna run through this again one more time. So here's what it looks like from the earth perspective. A and B are moving outwards. A is moving up and to the right, B is moving down. And then let's see it from B's perspective. B sits still, A is moving faster up uh, and to the, uh, a little bit more up and the earth is moving back uh, and away. And then from A's perspective, 
right? Remember, A was moving up and to the right. Now we see they're both moving off in this other direction away from A. So this is what we want to understand. If I look in here at this code, uh, forget all this. Here are the velocity vectors relative to A, uh, uh, relative to Earth. So what does this notation mean? This is the velocity of A relative to Earth. It's two in the I hat, one in the J hat, zero in the K hat. So it's up and to the right. How about B? This is the velocity of B relative to the Earth. It's moving to the right and down. Now notice right here, how did I figure out the, uh, the Earth's velocity? Well, what I did is I said, the velocity of the Earth relative to ball B is exactly opposite ball B relative to the Earth, right? If ball B is moving to the right relative to Earth, that means the Earth is moving to the left or negative to the right, et cetera, et cetera. And then this equation we're going to talk about. And so, um, but these are the equations that I use to do this. It's using the relative velocity equations. So we could come back to this in a minute. This probably doesn't make a lot of sense yet, but let's take a look at these equations and see if we can make this make sense. Uh, and if you want, um, I'll give you a link to that code in a minute. Let me, uh, I forgot to give you the link to that, but I'll give it to you in a minute. That way you could play with this on your own. You could copy it. And if you don't know how to code, I'll, I'll teach you that later in the semester. Sorry, hold on, something's stuck here. Oh, come on. There we go. All right, sorry about that. That's not what we're starting with. Markers falling all over. All right, so I wanna just give you some tips on using these equations. So it turns out if you have two objects moving, there's A and B, and they're both moving, it depends what they're moving relative to. So, right, A could be moving relative to me, or it could be moving relative to B. It's important that we now clarify what is moving relative to what. So typically we'd say VAE, that's equal to velocity of A relative to Earth. Or, you know, we could pick a different object. We could do relative to Mars if we were on Mars or relative to a train if we were on a train. Okay, so velocity EA is different, right? It's the velocity of Earth relative to A. Now think about this, right? Right now, uh, if I move this way relative to the Earth, that's the same thing as the Earth moving that way relative to me. And so there's no real way to distinguish that. We always feel like we're moving relative to the earth, but you could equally say the earth is moving. If I move forwards relative to the earth, that's the same thing as saying the earth is moving backwards relative to me. We can't really distinguish between those in a mathematical sense. They're, yeah. So what we say here is V E A is equal to negative V A E. Okay, and this is just a useful, that you just gotta know this fact, all right? Um, questions about that fact? Just, you gotta accept that. All right, um, and so once we, yeah, and that's what I was trying to show you with that simulation, great. So uh, next, this is the other key equation when we're doing relative velocity equations, velocity, a, B. So if I want to know the velocity of A relative to B, that would equal A relative to Earth plus Earth relative to B. Some people write this in a different way, right? Another classic way you'll see this written I'm 
let me make that minus sign pop. And I hope you agree. Whoops, let me move this down just a little bit. Sorry about that. So in this case, think about this. If I switch the order of these subscripts, I get a minus sign. So these two sentences are equivalent. All right. This sentence, that sentence, same thing. Now, in this case, what I like to do is I like to emphasize this one. And all that matters is you find a way that works for you. Now, you don't have to choose my way, but this is how I remember it. And it helps me keep things straight when I'm writing these equations. In this case, I notice that if I want to relate A to B, it's the same thing as E in the middle here, so to, so to speak, right? Imagine if you put A relative to Earth relative, and then Earth relative to B. Well, the Earth isn't moving relative to itself, so it kind of drops out. And that's essentially what's happening here. So I call this the squeeze out, right? If E is the middle variable, the other side of the equation, it gets squeezed out and dropped, right? So instead of being A, E, E, B, the E's get squeezed out and we just get A, B. This helps me remember it. Are there other correct ways to do it? You bet. I just told you one. Does someone else maybe have a different way to explain it? Sure. If that works for you, great. If this, I, I just find this works for me. In these problems, if we want to understand relative velocity, I want to point out it's essentially vector addition. What's going to happen in these problems is you're going to get a word problem. And that's going to tell you two of the three vectors and the hardest part is for students to read correctly and identify the two vectors that matter. So the idea is you read the question, identify two of the vectors, solve for the third vector using vector math. It's that simple, but students are terrible at this, I've discovered. So that's why we got to practice it a little bit. All right. Um, all right, I kind of did that quickly. I have no idea how much relative velocity some of you've had. I know that my students from 110 have had a significant amount. So I'm gonna pause for a sec. Any, any questions, don't be shy. Some of you, this may be brand new and you've never seen it. So if so, if you have any questions, ask them. I'm gonna go to gallery view for a sec. Okay, oof as in, oof as in this is weird and you need some practice kind of thing or oof as in too easy or? I didn't even like, I don't know. I, I have like very, very, very minimal experience with this because I took uh, young bloods. Gotcha. Content, so. Okay. So what we're going to do now is you don't really learn something by me saying some stuff on the screen, right? We learn it by yeah. practicing. So that's what's next. Let's go ahead and try a problem. So those of you that had me for class, if you've already done all these problems, you could skip and try and do the hardest one or something. But let's just start with a screen share and see where we're at here. Whoops, um, right here. All right, now, um, these are some good beginner questions. So um, we're gonna try to start with 4.28 and see. So students that have done this before with me, see if you could do it without looking at the solutions. Um, those of you that haven't, let's try and do this problem. Things are really easy when it's moving right, left, and, and, and up and down. But when things are at weird angles, then we have to work a little bit harder. That's why I want to start here. If you have trouble at all with 4.28, you can come back here and do these uh, in a minute. All right. That said, let's start with 4.28. Let me just get it up there on the screen. All right. So we have a student A walking with this speed relative to earth. The drone, which is, uh, okay, so we have a drone which is following student A, records student B moving with this speed directed south of west. So this right here, that's a velocity, right? It's a magnitude or a speed and a direction. So this is a velocity. What velocity is it? Is it the velocity of A relative to Earth? Is it the velocity of B relative to what? What is it? The velocity of B relative to A. This is velocity of B relative to A. Perfect. So that's what this is right there. What's that top line telling us? This first line, what is that giving us? 
velocity a with relative respect to earth. to earth a relative to earth so we've got these two vectors here so i've got velocity of a relative to earth and then what is the question asking what is b relative to earth so we want v b relative to earth so that's the setup where we know this and so this one nice job everybody the idea is we need to figure out this vector over here this vbe and we have those two vectors so what is one way to do that give me an equation that relates them v of b relative to a minus v of a relative to e so you said v wait v sorry i wrote the wrong color you said vba and then you said what minus vae minus VAE. Mm -hmm. and let's check i believe that should work out now i can't remember if that's going to be the right answer or not so let me do this too this is a proposal so what I remember, I have to rewrite this in that squeeze out way. Oops, I forgot a vector. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this VBA, and then I'm gonna say plus, if I wanna flip the sign, what does that do here? Hmm, this is not good. VEA? Yeah, so now, when I look at this one, this is not the right squeeze out, right? So I know if I have a plus, I should get the squeeze out. This is not valid. So how would I correct this first line? Change the sign. Yep. So now when I look at this, sorry, I don't know. Uh, nobody else calls this the squeeze out, but I do. So now I look at this, right? A gets squeezed out on this side. There's no A over there. This looks like, it. okay, and so that's how you use that squeeze out. You just, it was just to check the signs. That's it. Okay. Um, so do you, you always use addition, right? You could out. use whatever you want as long as it's correct. I like to use addition. That way I can check the squeeze out. So if I, I know for me, from my experience, if I always use a plus sign right here, I should always get the variable in the middle disappearing on the right side or on the other side of the equation. Is that good, Dom? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and so you could see that I didn't see it right away either. I have to do this myself because these problems are easy to screw up. The rest of this is straight vector math. So now, uh, what is a good strategy anytime you have a vector problem? If you really wanna understand a vector problem, what should you do with all these numbers up here? Like this crap. What write you them have? down. Or write them down. And what else? I would draw an arrow. Draw it. So if you do not draw this stuff, usually you screw it up. So let's draw vector A. It says, so here's a coordinate system for vector A. Oh, sorry. I mean, VAE. It says 30 degrees north of east. So I start at east. That's right here. I go 30 degrees north of that. So this is north. And typically we usually call this I hat and E. I hat and east are usually interchangeable. North and J hat we usually assume are interchangeable, not always. And I'll get to the chat in just a sec here. Uh, but I just wanna clarify, this is 30 degrees. This is 4.0 meters per second. Sorry, I was lazy with sig figs on the 30 degrees. And so we could now figure out the components of that vector, which is, this is my picture for VAE. And then I promised I would get to the chat. Let me check what's in the chat. Yes, Isaac, uh, good job. Which is what, uh, so that's what I would do first is draw them so that I could break them down into Cartesian and make sure I have a picture to help me understand it. So good job, all of you that contributed. Thank you. All right. And so, <laughs> oh, Gesundheit. Uh, if we want to break down VBA, let's draw this one. 
which way is that one going south of west so it starts at west here it starts at west and it goes 50 degrees this way about like that sorry this picture isn't perfect you can see i'm trying to draw them the arrow looks a little bit longer because it's supposed to be a little bit longer i'm ignoring sig figs because i'm lazy All right and so we could figure out uh, this vector right here. I've got the components. So at this point, I think it's very straightforward. We know VBA, we know VAE. You can add them together and get the job done. Um, I'm gonna pause while this is all up here. Uh, is any of this familiar or are there any questions or do people want me to keep rolling or you wanna keep, you want me to do a little bit more or is this okay? Could you reiterate why um, initially you can do minus VEA? Um, oh, remember, by definition, VAE, there's a mathematical relationship that's equal to negative VEA. If you switch the order of the subscripts, the objects go opposite directions. I'll show you that in the simulation again in just a minute just to show you that that's really what's happening. But um, um, that's just a mathematical fact that we could use. Basically, if I go to the right relative to the earth, there's no difference between that and saying the earth goes to the left relative to me. Switch the sign on the vector, you could switch the subscripts. Um, whoever asked that, was that okay? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I'll show you that in the simulation if you just watch in just a second. All right, other questions while all this is still up here on the screen? Maybe I'll just confirm. I'm being really lazy now, but hopefully you agree this side should be four sine or cosine of 30. This side right here. Cosine. Cosine, yep. So obviously you would do all the sig figs. I'm just really lazy. So there's four cosine 30. This side right here would be four sine 30, right? Now over here, let's look at the blue one, which has got some minus signs. Let me, somebody probably just put the answer in the chat too. Oh my gosh, zoom. It's like, oh my gosh, zoom. There, yep, okay, cool. Sheesh. All right, so then here, you're gonna get something like, what is this? Eight, in this case, it's cosine. Now someone might be saying, is it positive or negative? I argue, look right here, I have a negative arrowhead, that's my minus sign. Right here, I have a negative J hat, there's my minus sign, so I would say this is eight sine 50. And so that's how you get the numbers to plug in. And then I hats go with I hats, J hats go with J hats. We don't have any K hats, we're good to go. Um, other questions while I got that up? Other questions? Okay, so I need to clear off this stuff. Remember, you've got this all in the solutions too. Maybe before I clear it, let's verify that's all in the solutions, all right? So what problem is this, 4.28? There it is right there, so there's my sketch. And so, oh my gosh, there's kind of the, oh my gosh. Oh, there's the sketch down below. Okay, I'm gonna clear this out. So we've got these and you can see I did the vector addition there. Um, all right, so that's pretty cool. Um, in particular, I'll point this out. This is the vector addition right here graphically, right? I don't know if you remember, but we said VBA uh, plus VAE equals VBE. So I'll write that again, just so you can see it. We said VBA, sorry, I switched to lowercase. That doesn't matter. Whoops, I just screwed up. That is equal to 
VBE, right? So when you look at this, imagine this right here, this blue dot that I'm drawing is the origin. I go first vector, tail to tip. And then at that one, I imagine drawing a new coordinate system, right? And I put my other vector, AE, which was up and to the right. And then I end up at this spot right here. From the first tail, the tail of VBA, to the last tip shows me where VBE should line up. And you can see we get this size speed here. I should be careful. What did I screw up in this sentence? There's a mistake, subtle mistake there. This should be negative? No. No? Well, let me ask, is this a vector on the right side? Oh, it's missing the... I should just take away the vector sign there, right? The magnitude of this vector is 4.46. The vector is not 4.46. Agreed? So I need to fix that up. I'll put a note to myself. Sorry, I got to make a note here. Remove on. Problem with this one? Was this 4.28? I think it was, right? Yeah, okay. All right, so let's see. Um, so far, so good. Let's look at this um, animation one last time here. So, whoops, I got to go to here. Check this out. I know that this was supposedly four, whoops, times cosine of, uh, let's see, radians of 30 degrees. I think this will get it done. And the other one was supposed to be four sine. First, uh, and then this one should be what? Uh, eight, and it was to the left and down, right? So it's negative eight times cosine of 50, whoops, times radians. So you have to convert it to radians for Python to do this. And then this one. should be sine. So what we're doing is we're using the Python. This should say convert 30 degrees to radians so that I could take the cosine of it. And hopefully I didn't screw up the function. Let's see if I got this right. And so what we'll do is we'll first look at it relative to Earth. There they go. Now let's look at it relative to B. And now we'll look at it relative to A. So I forget what we were supposed to do. I might do this. I'm going to slow this simulation down a little bit just so I could see it a little bit better. All right. And so um, if we want to see B's velocity relative to the Earth, we'll look at it in this frame. So there it goes. Oh, shoot. <laughs> what did I do wrong, everybody? What did I do wrong? Did you catch that? I just totally screwed up the problem on the simulation. Did you notice? Let's go back there and see. I'll show you the code really quick. What did I screw up? B isn't relative to Earth? Yeah, these numbers were for B relative to A, weren't they? So I'd have to rewrite the code and that's gonna be more substantial. So that's what I screwed up, right? If you look back at our problem, oops, give me just a second here. Oh, come on, Zoom. The idea was right here, B uh, relative to A, 
because the drone is following student A. So I just made the classic mistake I told you students always do. I said that was relative to the earth when it wasn't. And so now you know the common mistake you might make. You'll get in a hurry. You know how to do these problems, but you'll accidentally plug in the numbers with the wrong subscript like I did. So since I don't have time to rewrite this code on the fly right in front of you, I'm not going to do that. But this gives you an idea. Um, if we did want to simulate it, how should that look? Well, we could go read the answer and plug in the correct values for VBE, right? And so if we go back here, if we get rid of this, bring up this, make it a little bit smaller because I can't see anything in this dang zoom. All right, we could actually take these values right here and we could punch, punch in those values right here. So it would be, what was it? South of West. So that's still the same, so whoops. All right. Oh my gosh, this is taking longer than I anticipated with all these clicks. All right. So there's the numbers that we need. So it should really be, uh, looks like I've even punched them in for you, right? Negative 1.678. Oops, I did a double negative. And then this one should be negative 4.128. So now this will actually be an accurate representation of this. So if I run this, oh, sorry, right there. Guess what you're gonna be doing later this semester. <laughs> All right, so now we can look at this one and run it relative to the earth. And that's what it looks like relative to the earth. Uh, and so here's what it looks like from B's perspective. And here's what it looks like from A's perspective. And notice from A's perspective, we see the numbers that were given in the initial problem, right? So from A's perspective, we see the four and the eight. All right. Woo. All right. Um, questions on that? I'm going to give you this link in case you want to play with it later. Now, if you're not familiar, um, I don't know if you could edit the parameters, but you can open up a GlowScript account, copy my program, paste it into yours, and then change the numbers to your heart's content and play with it. So um, yeah, I haven't had time to make sliders for that yet. All right, um, so there's some relative velocity for us. Let's try a hard problem now, all right? I'm gonna do another one. Uh, let's go to here. Let's go to here. Uh, I'll let you look at these two on your own later. They're good problems. Oh. All right. Let's get nasty, people. So this was a test question one time, and basically you would be surprised. People think they know this stuff, and then you give them just the subtlest curveball, and they just have all kinds of trouble. Try this problem right now without looking at the solutions. Chat with anybody you want to, whatever, right? And see if you could at least write down the correct set of knowns and unknowns and see if you have an idea how to attack it, okay? So give this one a shot. I'll give you a minute or two. See if you can start the problem and just try to make progress on it and see where you get stuck.
I'll give you two more minutes to struggle on this problem, all right? Two more minutes, then we'll start discussing it and see what questions you have. So try your best. It's okay to fail. All right. So um, I have no idea if you're if you're in the groove, you don't have to respond at all. If you think you're going to make it, keep keep working. If you have any questions, does anybody have any thoughts, questions, or is this is this like really easy, or is this does anybody have any questions? I remember this question from last semester, and that when I was trying to do it last time, it was really confusing especially for the fact that, you know, you don't have the initial uh, date or the initial angle from uh, the ball relative to the train, but you have the, the, the angle from the ball relative to the earth. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I remember there's a lot of trig that, I'm, that was involved in this question. That's right. Yeah. So let's start, let's, um, let's give some labels on here. So let's say this one right here. Sorry, I'm trying to draw this as blue here. So let's um, actually, let me go to the solution and use the same colors as in the solutions. So this is 4.31 and a half. Okay, so I, I good thing we did that because I would have messed up the color code. So let me clear the colors off. All right, so, and since I have it here, let's see if this makes sense. I use T for train, B for ball, and E for earth or the stationary ground. So we were told this one, there's not that much confusing about the train. The train, we know it's moving 20 meters per second. So that's about 45 miles per hour to the right. Okay, now look at this one. Uh, this leads to what Esteban was saying. We don't know anything about this angle. So in this figure here, right, this is theta of the ball relative to the train, and we are not told that information. We know that when the ball takes off, the ball is going to go fly in this way, and we're told that this angle, theta of the ball relative to the earth, is 30 degrees. Before you get ahead of yourself, does this seem reasonable? What does the train's velocity do? If the train is moving at 20, that should increase the X component of the ball's velocity. Think, if you throw this thing on still earth, it's going to go this direction at 40. Well, now what you're doing is you're saying, well, I'm going to add, that's I need to draw it somewhere else. Hold on. Right. So we know. Ah. Right. You're going to throw the ball this way with speed 40. Right. I'm going to leave off units. In addition to that, I'm going to add this vector, the train's velocity, which is 20. Again, ignoring units. As a result, the ball goes flying off this way. 
at some unknown speed, but I do know from looking at it, this angle is 30. And that's the key here. You have to say, what do I know and what do I not know? I'm going to pause for a second and see if this picture makes sense, this graphical vector addition, right? This is the velocity of the ball relative to Earth flying away at a 30 degree angle. Hold on. This one right here is the velocity of the ball relative to the train. That is the direction you aim, not the way it goes, right? And then up here on top, this is the velocity of the train relative to the Earth. And notice we see this equation right here that I'm circling right there. The ball's velocity relative to the train plus the train relative to the Earth adds up to the ball relative to the Earth. We see that the T gets squeezed out. I'm going to let you digest this for a minute and see if you have questions. I'm going to stop talking. Any questions? That is a difficult setup. So, yeah, go ahead. So, VB, once you do that, you have the magnitude of that vector, and then you have its degree. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, look at the look at the equation immediately below the black circle there. Do you agree that is what you know and what you don't know in there? And I might get rid of that black circle in just a second. Okay, just so you could read better. Do you agree with the next line of the equation? Yes. And so now the trick is vectors, you can handle X motion and Y motion independently. Woohoo! I'm sure that's the reaction you had, right? So what I did is I did one equation for the X and one equation for the Y. To look at this, here's an I hat, I hat, I hat. That's where this comes from. If I do the other one, let's do a different color. This is a J hat and a J hat. So that's where these come from. Pause and make sure you believe that. And then from there, there's a bunch of ways you could go to solve it, but you actually have to practice your math chops, right? So when I see this, I'm like, okay, there's lots of ways to solve this. All right, um, I'm gonna pause for a second. Now I know Esteban and I are talking back and forth, but anybody else, right? I'm expecting this one to be very confusing. So please feel free to speak up. I will try to clarify anything in here that's confusing to you. So yeah, it doesn't have to be just Esteban and I talking. So I don't rem I don't remember, but can you take so can you take the ratio of both those equations? Okay, so if you take the ratio, what can you figure out? Well, I was what, thinking what drops out. Um. So Esteban's saying, take the ratio of these two equations. Give me just a second. If I take the ratio, whoops, ah. If I take this equation right here and divide it by that equation right there, on the right side, do you see the VBEs will cancel? Yeah. And so then you're left with something with a sign in it, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So... Do you, and so if you want, I'll just mention subtly. <laughs> uh, so, let's see. Oh, hold on a sec. Give me just a second. Maybe you did problem 1.46, which tells you one method for solving this graphically. Ah. Go ahead, Esteban. 
Should I scroll down? Um, well, I was thinking uh, taking the ratio the other way so that way you get sine over cosine and then you can just make that tangent and solve for, solve for theta. Like theta. this, does that make sense? Yeah. That's one way to do it. And that is essentially exactly the same as problem 1.40, whatever I just said. I know you think that I'm just making you do this stuff for weird, but that's exactly like problem 1.46 with different numbers. And so if you did problem 1.46, you'd be like, oh, I know how to do this one. This is one method I describe. Let me show you the next method I describe. So the uh, so um, what Esteban suggested was um, uh, eliminate the VBE term. So if you're curious, what you could do is take each equation, square it, and add it together, and then you get a quadratic formula and figure out VBE. So I'll pause and let you guys digest this one. And obviously you could see the clever style beneath. It turns out knowing the basics of the theory is not enough to get the job done in a physics class. You have to get your hands dirty. You have to do the math and follow these things through. And if you do it, all of a sudden you're so strong, you can ace anything I throw at you. And it's just a really tough class physics is, right? If you do lots of practice, you just ace everything. And if you don't, you fail everything. There's not a lot of middle ground. It's very difficult, right? Or at least get a B, right? You'll at least get a B if you practice. Uh, sometimes to get an A, you just have to be good. All right. All right. Um, let's look down here at the clever, clever method. It turns out knowing how to draw a picture can save you tons of work, especially if you know the law of cosines. This is the law of cosines. A, uh, C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cosine of the angle between. And so if you do that, this is a one line problem. Um, this is kind of a, a review on vector addition too. Notice graphical vector addition, which seems like a stupid skill, all of a sudden becomes very useful in these type of problems. These relative velocity additions, if you can't draw them, usually you don't understand them. If you don't understand them, you usually miss them on a test. So, um, gosh, I know you have the solutions too. So at some point you kind of need to digest it at your own speed, but is this, is this helping or is this making life worse or um, is Wait, this exposing you? Can you explain how to do the clever way again? Yeah, yeah, let's look at it. So again, I'm trying to expose you to what you know or don't know yet. So look at the clever style, right? What I did was I said, well, I know, here's the way the person throws the ball, right? 40 at this angle. And then I know the train's moving this way. So that's gonna affect the ball's velocity relative to the earth, right? T gets squeezed out and I end up with this. Okay. Yeah, the clever way is really easy. The initial way is just algebra. It's just algebra. So I recommend you work through all three and discover the merits of all three. They, all, they have a place. By the way, those first two brute force methods are used again in chapter nine when we do momentum. So it's worth seeing them and just knowing them. Once you do them once, you've got it in your quiver of tricks for forever and you'll never forget it, I promise you. Okay, so I would do all three solutions here and just follow it through. So, okay, next. I said, well, if this angle's 30, this should be 30, right? Alternate interior angles from whatever uh, geometry class you had was. Then I know that I, I say, like, let's say this is, um, uh, let's say this is vector C. This is vector 
A and this is vector B, right? The law of cosine says C squared. It's just like the Pythagorean theorem with a correction. It's A squared plus B squared, but it's not a right triangle anymore. So I've got to subtract off two A, B, cosine of the angle. And that's the law of cosines if you look it up. All right, um, Dom, did that help you? Yeah, that's it's one of the law of, laws of cosines for uh, yeah, exactly. non-right triangles, right? Exactly, because okay. think about it. If it's a right triangle, what is theta? Then theta would have been like 90 or- 90, or one, and this yeah. term drops out because cosine yeah. of 90 is zero. So you oh, get yeah. back the Pythagorean theorem. If the, so that's if you have trouble memorizing this, well, you could do the other methods. <laughs> it, or this could be something you write down and then, right, then you just have it written down nearby. And on your test for this class, you can, right, you could have, just write this equation in your book and then you know where it is. Write it on the back of the book in, in a post-it note or something. Right. The other thing that you could do is, um, you know, I, I don't know, you could use Wolfram Alpha, right? That's legal during a test. And you could just say law of cosines and then it'll probably tell you it right there. Um, all right. Good. All right. What do you think? Uh, other questions? Relative velocity, vector addition, same thing but it's word problems, so you gotta be a little careful. And it's very tricky when you don't know both parts of a single vector. So this is kind of as hard as these get. If you can learn this one, you could, this is the hardest possible relative velocity problem I could ever think of, ever. All right, let's take a look here. Let me see if I could do something else here. Maybe you're curious. Uh, let's go into here. Whoops, oh, zoom, I just... I'll be so happy if I never have to do Zoom the rest of my life, but that's just not a fact. Let me go to somewhere else here. Let me go to right here. Let me go to Physics 161. Let's look at some old exams, all right? So let's look at this one. This is an exam from last year. Uh, let's get rid of this panel. I don't need this, do I? Oops, come on. All right, I don't know how to get rid of that panel. I don't care. Let's zoom in a little bit. I don't want to worry about that right now. Okay, uh, fine. Oh. Hmm. Take a look. This is the old exam question from last year. Which one of these problems does it look, does this look more like 4.28, the first one we did today with the two balls, the orange or the red ball and the blue ball, or does it look like the one we just talked about with the train and the throwing the ball relative to the train? What do you think? Is this a red ball, blue ball? Nope. So therefore it's the other one. Here's the trick. I give you the direction this is traveling, right? That's the direction the ball is thrown relative to Earth. So I gave you the angle relative to the Earth. I gave you the speed relative to the air. Do you see it now? I don't know. Does that make sense, oh, Don? Yeah. Yeah, that does make sense. So I give you the, the speed in one coordinate system. I give you the angle in the other coordinate system. It's exactly the same problem. And you could see the problem that you're going to have. It's... Okay, did you do the practice or not? And do you understand a method that works for you? Now, I'll be honest with you, right? I mean, you can probably learn this stuff on the fly during the test. However, you're going to be so slow, you completely fail. You people are not dumb, right? If you try to learn during the test time, you get an F. 
you have to learn it before test time. And the test is showing you already learned how to do it, right? So obviously you could read the book. You're not stupid. You could learn and figure it out. You'll run out of time completely. So the key is practice in advance, learn it and struggle with it before test day and you could rock it. Let's go back and look at that test and see what might be expected of you. Just because just we've basically finished chapter four now. And so we're going to go on to questions, but let's take a look here. Let's go back to this page. How about that first one? Hopefully you feel good on that first one, right? Question zero. Just do some units. Let's check the second one. This is a real life problem. I, I read the number off a, a gas hose and I estimated the length of this and blah, 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 blah. Notice I ask you to figure out something with grams, engineering notation, prefixes, and you have to get your sig figs right, okay? So it's a pretty, this is a classic chapter one problem. Look at this weird number here. You've got to look at the units. You say, oh, crap. Um, it says per second. So you've got to convert this from days to seconds. Oh, shoot. I need mass. So I've got to multiply by an area to get rid of that meter squared. All right. Oh, it's got a cylinder. I need to know that he's talking about the sidewall. So if you did not do problem... Right, You could figure this out on the fly, but you're going to be so slow if you hadn't done problems 1.49 and 1.50, where this same type of geometry was discussed in detail on page 18 in the workbook. I'm not trying to trick you. I'm trying to see if you actually did what I asked you to do. <laughs> That's it. Okay, here's a couple of vectors. Figure out a dot product, figure out a cross product, figure out an angle between. Notice something that students screw up on this one. When you do this dot product, will the answer have units? What do you think? No. Yes. No. <laughs> There's units on the numbers. And so and that's why I'm asking you right now, right? Take a look. Here's the number. Let's see those units hidden there. And here's some units here. What are the units you get? Yeah, I got I got confused because I forgot. So the, the the dot product is a scalar, right? So that means it's that's right. It no doesn't direction, have it doesn't have i hats or j hats, correct? But it has units. Okay, that's why I got. So confused. yeah, so this one would have no i hats or j hats. Unit vectors are the things that have no units. So if you did your chapter three homework, right, you can see it's just straight up plug in these numbers, you'll get joules. And sometimes people forget you got to include the units in the answer. So joules per Tesla times Tesla, the final units would be joules. So students would lose a half point because they forget to write the J for the units, things like that. But it's basically do a cross product, do a dot product. Okay. But, um, other questions on that? Well, I've got it up on screen. Anybody? It's a straight chapter three problem. This was done in chapter three as well. If you don't remember it, you can go look at it. For, for that one, for the last one, it's it's the dot product over the magnitude, right? Is that how, that's how you get the oh, angle? So, so if you want, so if we want to get say mu hat, which is something we actually use in physics 163, this actually relates to physics uh, of an MRI machine, if you care. So this relates to the physics of MRIs, but we got to do the basics first. Mu hat is equal to mu vector divided by mu magnitude. The angle between is equal to cosine inverse of what? You remember? Does anybody have this memorized? All right, I'll do it. That's supposed to be a mu. Mu dot B over magnitude mu 
and magnitude b yeah that's what i meant right there so the, the yeah, dot the dot product the, over the over the magnitude oh i see yes 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 so this is how you get the angle between and this is how you get a unit vector notice i will do this on a test day where i'll say this means vector this means hat vector or unit vector so this is a vec this is a unit whoa that's not how you spell unit with a w this is a unit vec and i expect you to know the difference in the symbols all right so it's just straight practice did you practice it can you do it and i will help you and like i said we have two lab days later on in the semester just for you to practice these practice tests. So you should not be practicing the practice test now. You should be doing your homework now, using the workbook if you have to, so that later on you could do the tests without the solutions and then check your answers. Let's scroll down the page. Let's see what this one is. Can you do math with sig figs and do you know what scientific notation is? That's pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, let's go to this one some plots all right we're going to take a look at some plots here uh great yeah this is super super straightforward just do you know how to read a graph what's the first thing i want you to do when you look at a graph do you remember look at the axis nice so this is a position right it's labeled twice man if you screw this up you'll grab the velocity equation or yeah, so look at the rules on page whatever it was for a position graph and you should be fine. But if you screw up and read the rules for a velocity graph, you're toast. For example, displacement. Displacement here, it just means how does the value change? So if you want displacement on an XT graph, it's just take the two numbers and subtract them, right? If you want displacement on a VT graph, that's when you use the area. Things like that. This should be straightforward, easy points. Um, and let's see what I do here. Ah, so here I give you a velocity. Same questions, different types of plots. Can you do it? Straightforwards. All right. Ooh. What does this one look like? Uh, projectile. Mm -hmm. So how about 2D motion? Does this remind you of any problems we've already done? Did the ski jump? It's a combination of the ski jump and 4.17. So let me see which problems those are. So this tells you how I mix things up. 4.17 at the bottom of page 74 talks about a projectile launched and it tells you the impact speed. That's what this one does. So if you haven't done 4.17 and 4.23, you would be toast on this problem, right? You could probably figure it out, but your odds go down because you haven't practiced those two problems. So that's a fun combination problem, all right? Uh, super straightforwards once you've seen those two problems and done them let's go That's to it. here oh go ahead so usually you relate um you usually relate them to the homework questions right not the i mean the required homework questions yeah just the, i don't know they all look the same to me dude okay so i have no idea i just make shit up all right okay and so when i make it up well, you know that every single problem in that book and every single problem on my old tests, they're all problems I've made up, right? Yeah. So you get to know me and I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to experience this in the group activity later. There's always at least one question that's just, you get scared by it and you freak out. The trick is don't lock up, trust your procedures, follow your procedures and, and just believe in yourself. And if you do that, you'll solve these problems that at first look insane. All right. You got to trust yourself, trust that you did the work, start the process, list your knowns, list your knowns correctly would be really nice. List your knowns correctly, list your equations, start solving for something. It's the same as every other problem we've done. All right. So yeah, you can do this stuff. Let's take a look at this one. 
Ooh, okay, I'll give you a second to read this one. See if you can figure out what type of problem this is. And I need to check something really quick here. Uh, oh, well, let's, we're almost through with this because I think we need to start the group activity at 1.30, right? So we st we've still got time. Let's take a look at this one. What, what does this problem remind you of? Uh, uh, the police one and the bad escargot pun. That's right. Cop and the speeder, which let me see if I have this one here. I made a, a simulation of this and I forgot to give it to you. So I, I forget if I showed you this. Let me... um. There you go. So um, that's a video. And if you scroll down in the video, somewhere in the comments, I tried to give you a link to a code that simulates that. So why don't I just look at that? I forgot to show you this the other day. So let me, All right? There we see max separation occurs. Oops. Oh my gosh, let me make this a little bit smaller here. And you can see the plots there below. And so if I run this one again, let me run it one more time here. So when I run this one, you can see it makes this plot. And we could see, you could kind of play with this later and kind of get a feel for it. It's actually very similar to the video, except I needed to divide all the numbers by 10 here. So uh, this one travels about uh, 16 meters. The one in the video travels about 1.6. So if you just take all these numbers and divide them uh, by 10, you'll basically get that video. So if that helps, that's cool. Um, so if you want to see that one, that's great. Let's stop the share. Whoops, I need to get back to the test. Oh my gosh, come on. Zoom. All right, where was I? I need to go to here. Ah, no, I need to go to here. Sorry. So basically, it's a cop and the speeder problem, right? Ooh. Ooh, look at this. Oh, but this is a little trickier. Look at this. It's like 2.37, right? Oh, oh, this is a it's a fun variation. This time they both accelerate, then one of them reaches constant speed, and the other one just keeps accelerating. So it's a slightly different problem than that. And you could see how I mix things up. The process is identical to the cop and the speeder problem, but the work is completely different, right? The algebra is slightly different because you got two terms. If you want another solution, wait till you practice this. Ooh, this is a fun. Here's an extra credit page. All right. This is that brain eating zombie, right? So uh, we're going to do video capture tomorrow in lab and analyze. Uh, sorry, we're not going to do zombies, people. We're not doing zombies. My bad. But you could see um, how could you get this theoretical equation? If you know velocity, is a function of position. And I ask you for position as a function of time, what do you do? Does anyone remember? Separate the variables. Exactly. And I said, I might put a separation of variables question on the test and this is it. Now this will probably make a lot more sense after we do lab tomorrow, but then you could see if you could plot it and actually do real science here on zombie video capture. All right, whatever. Um, so if you practice, you're going to get this. If you don't, you won't. It's just the way it is, right? Now you kind of, you could, let me show you something else here, right? To be clear. Let's go back, right? You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight old tests with the solutions. If you guys can't get this done, it's not my fault. I'm just going to fail you. All right. So if you practice, I guarantee you'll do all right. If you don't practice, you're almost certain to fail unless you're a genius. That's there's no secret. Go ahead. Are we going to when are we going to have this test? Are we having a chapter one through four test? No, we're not having oh. a chapter one through four test. So let's look over here. 
and just kind of give you an idea. So uh, sorry, I don't have the whole semester up yet, but so we're in week three. Tomorrow in lab, we're gonna do this stuff and you could read this tonight, watch a training video. I gave you all the stuff you need. Uh, since I'm here, I'm just gonna show you that. Oh, that's all it says. It must be in the other link. Sorry, oh my gosh. <sighs> Canvas, I think it's this one, sorry. I forgot to delete that one. I give you a, 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 a video tips, uh, gives you all the tips you need here. Oh, there it is. So this tells you everything about lab tomorrow. So you can read this. I gave you a practice file. If you want to practice tonight, you can see here's the software you need to download. It's free. Here's a training video that I made. Here's a video that I use to make that video. So you could practice right along with me and you could make sure you know the equipment before you come in tomorrow and that will make your life easier. Um, but so, uh, Let's get back into here. And then where's the, let's kind of look at the course overview, right? You've got the, the syllabus too, but let me just bring this up here. Where is that in this one? Syllabus. These are about the same. This is all in here. All right. And then, oh my gosh, get this thing out of here. Let's do this. Just so I could see it in a normal, come on. All right, so if I scroll down a bit, this gives you the whole schedule, right? So we've got a group activity today. Next week, you'll have a real quiz by yourself, then a group activity, then another quiz. And then here we'll have, um, there's a couple of weeks with no quizzes. And that's when you do practice tests here, you do practice tests here, then we have spring break, and then we'll have a combined chapters one through eight test. So that kind of gives you an idea. And then we keep going, we shift into coding labs for the last half of the semester. There's occasionally some group activities or whatever quizzes. And then down here, it looks like there's gonna be a homework quiz here. So during this oral exam, I'll quiz you on homework, probably on chapters one through eight. So you better have your chapters one through eight homework done over spring break, if not before. And then here, I'll give you a homework quiz probably in Canvas for chapters nine through 13 later. And then there's a, a final exam with some orals after that. So that's kind of the, the big picture. Uh, Esteban, did that answer your question? Yeah, so it's pretty much all those little quizzes and then it's just gonna be the final. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's a big, there's a big test here. That so during this week, we don't have any lecture. It's an oral. It's a, it's a written and an oral. Oh, okay. So you're going to take the uh, written test during your class period on Monday. And then there's no other class or lab that week. But you're going to schedule one-on-one -on -one appointments with me that week where I quiz you oral exam on what you did on your test and how. Yeah, so that's where that's coming. So basically, you've got to just just keep working hard until we get close to spring break and then reevaluate where you're at. Make sure you test yourself in lab on those two days where we have lab test days and then be ready to rock coming back from spring break. Cool. That's when your first big serious test is. All right. Um, good stuff. Um, at this point, I would like you to leave your uh, screens on. You could take a break, but if you just don't leave Zoom so that I could start making the breakout rooms for the group activity that is for credit right afterwards. So at 1.30 that starts. So why don't you try and get back here at say like 1.28? That way, if I have any comments I need to say. So you guys can zone out for the next uh, nine minutes and then just come back and be ready to do your group activity. Okay. Are you putting us in the usual groups? I'm going to put you in that list of groups that I sent out in the email the other day. Okay. <laughs> 